lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota, and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. In today's show, I'm sharing the top 40 most wanted list, or as I like to say, the plants we pine for, the plants that gardeners around the country mention when you ask them to finish this sentence, I wish I planted more, and then fill in the blank. These are essentially the gorgeous blooms and delicious edibles we can't seem to get enough of. And that's the topic of today's show. And it's all coming up after the Guard News Roundup. But first, I want to start out by saying thank you for listening to the show this week. There are so many great gardening podcasts out there, and I'm so honored that you're spending time listening to this show. This week, I had a special treat. There was an article written in an online newspaper in Plymouth, Massachusetts, that listed what they considered to be the four best gardening podcasts, and Still Growing was listed, which was such a treat for me, in addition to two of my absolute favorites, You Bet Your Garden and A Way to Garden with Margaret Roach. I listen to those shows myself every single week. And then there was one mention that I hadn't heard of before. So I'm going to be checking that one out. And so here's a tip for you guys. It's called Gardening with Angelo. And here's a little description. It says, with more than 30 years as a garden center owner and 20 years as a grower, Angelo Petiti shares his knowledge out of Cleveland, Ohio. Topics include dealing with plants that are growing ahead of schedule, what to do to make your garden the best in the spring, and preparing your garden for the various seasons. So that's another great one to check out. And needless to say, there are tons more. Now, with regard to this show, if you're looking for a deeper interaction on the subject of gardening, the best way for you to do that is to join the Still Growing Listener Community. It's a private Facebook group that I host for gardeners of all skill levels and locations. In fact, there's gardeners from all around the world. And what I love about our group is that it's not overwhelmingly large. It's just a nice little group for listeners of the show, and they seem to have two key things in common. One, they share a passion for gardening, and two, they have a curiosity to learn more. And bonus for you, it's free and easy to join. So all you have to do to come hang out with us, don't be shy, is just go to Facebook and search for Still Growing Podcast Group and then request to join. So if you're not yet a member, just head on over and join for free. The next time you're in Facebook, just search for Still Growing Podcast Group and our group will pop right up. I want to make sure I continue to recognize some of the folks who joined over the last couple of weeks as I've been recovering from rotator cuff surgery. I'm trying to get caught up here a little bit, so let me go ahead and welcome Kelvin Zeus, Michelle Mix, Andre Grushetsky, Nat Alley, Mary Syke, John McCann, Peter Groh, and Sue Luftig. And Sue was the lucky listener last week that won a copy of The Foodscape Revolution, courtesy of Bree Arthur. So again, the Facebook group is the only place I go to pick lucky listeners for any giveaways related with the podcast. So that's another great reason to join the Facebook group. The other thing I'd like to do, and we're coming up on a new rotation here uh, starting in June, is I have put together a listener advisory board, and it's made up of volunteers from the Facebook group, usually four to six folks. And we chat on a weekly basis. It's a way for me to get feedback on ideas I have for the show, get suggestions, gather advice. And I started it back in January, and it's been absolutely invaluable to me. And there are six women from the Facebook group, listeners of the show, that have been helping me out this first four-month period of time. And they are Beth Engel, Denise Pugh, Denise gardens in North Mississippi and is a contributing writer to Mississippi Gardener Magazine. Amy Von Atchen, Patricia Chandler Newport. Patricia is the owner of Backyard Urban Gardens out of Kego Harbor, Michigan. 
Deb Gibson, and Peggy Ann Montgomery. Peggy Ann Montgomery is the brand manager at American Beauty's Native Plants. She was also featured in episode 553, where she talked all about incorporating native plants into your landscape. And this is a trend we're seeing in more and more garden plans and designs thank goodness, this year and hopefully into the future. So if you're tempted to do that or you're curious to learn more, head on over to episode 553 and listen to Peggy Ann's wonderful talk. I had a chance to listen to it last year at the Garden Bloggers Fling, and I knew I wanted her to come on the program and basically share her presentation with us, which is exactly what she did, and it was wonderful. Anyway, these six ladies make up the Listener Advisory Board. It was the first board that I put together, and they have done a tremendous job just giving me feedback, suggestions, and helping me out with resources and just general encouragement. So I can't thank them enough. You know, one of the unique things about our Facebook group is the fact that I always invite guests that have been on the show to join our Facebook group because I had the idea that it would be so wonderful for you guys to be able to reach out to guests when you have questions about an episode that you are super curious about or have something you need answered. You have a way to directly contact those guests and ask your question in the Facebook group. And that's been super helpful. And there are many guests of the show that are now members of the group. And they include Joel Karsten of Strawbale Gardens, Deborah Madison, the author of Vegetable Literacy, Marta McDowell, the author of All the President's Gardens, Tara Nolan, the author of Raised Bed Revolution, Josh Volk, the author of Compact Farms, and of course, Brie Arthur, the author of the book, The Foodscape Revolution. She was on in episode 569 just a few weeks ago. So as you're listening to shows, if you have questions or you just want to reach out and thank them for being on the show, feel free. Guests of the show always love hearing from people who appreciate their content. And then finally, just a heads up, last week I mentioned that I was going to be working on an episode devoted to creating a memory garden. These are gardens that get created to honor a loved one who's passed away. And I'd love to hear from you if you've done that, if you've created a memory garden in honor of someone else. So if you have and you'd love to share your story with us, I'd like to invite you to contact me at the number for the podcast. Yes, the show has its own phone number, and it's 865-333-GROW. So 865-333-GROW. And if you don't have the numbers or the letters on your keypad, it's 865-333-4769. And what I'm looking for are people who have created memory gardens or helped create memory gardens. Just to hear what you did, the plants you used, maybe some of the hardscapes you incorporated, whether it was benches or inscribed rocks, special trees or plant material. I'd love to hear how you honored your loved ones. All right, now it's time for the Garden News Roundup. This is a curated group of posts and articles that I've shared over the past week with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group. And it's made up of a dozen different segments from updates on past guests to articles featuring fascinating folks in the world of horticulture that I'd love to chat with. And that's something I call the Dream Guest Segment. I also cover news and information on special topic areas like sustainability and science. And then the other segments are really designed to honor the commitment of the show to helping you and your garden grow. And they are the How to DIY, Continuing Ed, The Plant Spotlight, Shopping, Recipes, Inspiration, and Quotables. Now, what's nice about this for you is that you can stay somewhat abreast of the news in horticulture and gardening just by listening to this part of the show each week. And you can easily check out these curated articles and posts for yourself because I share it all with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group. So if you hear something and you want to read the full article, there's no need to take notes or track down links. Just head on over to the group and join. You know, 
one way you can make what you see on Facebook more customized to your interests is to join groups on Facebook that focus on topics you're interested in. And if you'd like to see more helpful posts about gardening, something I think everyone who listens to this show would like to see and read more of, then by all means, join the listener community for the show. Because everything you hear that is shared in the Garden News Roundup each week is posted to the Still Growing Podcast Group Facebook feed. And unlike some of the spammy or time-wasting content that gets shared with abandon on social media these days, the content I share with you, my listener community, is something that I work very hard to make sure is helpful and worthwhile for you. All right, let's get started. In the guest update segment this week, I have three updates from past guests. Jenny Prince of American Meadows, who was featured in episode 566, the show that was all about getting kids to help you in the garden, had a special offer for listeners of the show if they order from American Meadows. It's $10 off any order of $40 or more for listeners of Still Growing. And all you have to do is use the coupon code STILLGROWING17. And that offer expires very shortly on May 31st, 2017. So if you're interested in that or want to check out American Meadows, give it a look. You'll save $10 off any order of $40 or more with the coupon code STILLGROWING17 all one word, but you'll have to use it quickly. It expires on May 31st. Megan Phelps of Seeds, Mulch, and Weeds. She was featured in episode 552, where we talked all about her experimental approach to gardening. She just wrote a post on her website that I thought she did a great job on, and she featured some of her perennial favorites. She takes gorgeous photographs. The one that stood out to me is her picture of comfrey, which she said is planted all around her apple trees because it's supposed to be good for the soil. Anyway, she did a great job listing her perennial favorites. Go ahead and check that out. And she's also a very fun person to follow on Twitter. She's got a great Twitter feed and it's under the handle Seeds, Mulch and Weeds. And then finally, in the guest update segment, Pam Pennick, the author of The Water Saving Garden, which was featured in episode 555, shared the most captivating, dramatic image in her Facebook feed yesterday. And it was the image of a birdhouse that was suspended about eight feet off the ground in front of her home. And the facade of this home is made of brick and The caption that she had written said, tragedy for the Wren family just outside my office window. Hashtag snake. Hashtag how did it get in there? And the image showed this Wren house suspended from the ceiling about a foot away from the brick wall. And when you look in the opening of the Wren house, all you see are the scales of a rat snake. This was absolutely extraordinary. So anyway, I shared it in the Facebook group and I said, this is pretty much all the kids and I talked about after school yesterday when I saw Pam's image come up on my Facebook feed. I showed it to the kids and I said, what do you think this is? The little Wren house looks like a big brown sponge. It's kind of an interesting looking house. So it's hard to even discern what the birdhouse was made of. And then when you look through the little opening and you see the scales, the kids weren't even sure what that was. And the first thing all of the kids said to me when they saw that picture is they thought it was a beehive. They thought that was the honeycomb of the beehive, the snake scales. So then when I shared with them that it was a wren house that a snake had gotten into, They were just completely shocked. So then, of course, the next question is, how did the snake get in there? This house is eight to nine feet off the ground and about a foot away from the side of this brick house. And so we started looking up on YouTube, can snakes climb walls? And sure enough, there are YouTube videos. There's actually a very well done one showing a snake climbing up a brick wall and how it goes right in the joints, the mortar joints of the bricks and completely conforms 
to those harsh angles. It's really something else. Anyway, Pam did a great job of not only sharing this on Facebook, but then actually sitting down and writing a very good blog post about it, complete with some extremely captivating images. First of all, the image of the birdhouse with just the scales of the snake showing through the opening. And then of the adorable Wren family, she had just taken pictures the previous day of the Wren family, the mom and the dad raising their weak old chicks that were right outside her office window. And then she's got this image of this snake all coiled up inside. And all you see is the last inch and a half of its tail hanging out the wren nest. And I love how Pam wrote about this. She said, overnight, apparently a rat snake had Houdini'd its way up the side of the house. Yes, rat snakes can climb brick walls about eight feet from the ground and across a foot of space to reach the birdhouse opening on the side facing away from the wall. It was quite a feat. Anyway, yesterday after Pam had made this discovery, she camped out in her office and she would look up periodically hoping to see the snake come out, but it just stayed put all day long, only occasionally shifting its position and showing the tip of its tail. So finally, when she left to make dinner, she took another look. It was dark outside, and so she had to use her cell phone flashlight to see what was going on. And sure enough, she spotted movement. The snake was coming out. Her whole family comes running, and then she started to take pictures. They're a little blurry because it was dark out, but you can clearly see the snake stretching for the brick wall while still being anchored into this birdhouse. It was absolutely amazing. And then, of course, because her family is outside and, and this all the lights are on and they're taking pictures, it kind of startled the snake. So rather than continue on trying to get out of the nest, he retreated right back in to the nest. And Pam wrote that he slithered in like an octopus, squeezing itself through a hole. And she's got pictures of all of this. And Pam wrote, going, going, gone. And so are the Wren chicks, sadly. But Pam's a realist. And she says, snakes have to eat too. And it's been fascinating to watch. And she continues on by saying, being wildlife friendly means accepting nature's brutality, which was happening even with the wrens as they fed live caterpillars and other insects to their young. I won't kill a snake in my garden unless I feel it poses a danger to my family. And rat snakes are harmless to humans and largely beneficial as they do hunt rodents. Still, it's painful to lose the wrens. Anyway, I shared Pam's blog post in the Still Growing Facebook group. And I encourage listeners of this program to go check out Pam's awesome blog. It's simply called Digging. So go check it out. It's at Penick.net, P-E-N-I-C-K.net. I would say just go ahead and subscribe after reading this post. Not only is this post particularly kind of fascinating, you can't turn away, but you'll love reading her work. She does a great job on her garden blog. All right, in sustainability this week, the Buffalo News shared a very nice post called Great Gardening, the Joy of Teaching Kids About Nature. This is by Sally Cunningham. And this article is all about sharing our love of gardening or nature with kids. And she references Richard Louv's landmark book, The Last Child in the Woods. And this is the book where the term nature deficit disorder was introduced and defined. What I love about what Sally wrote is that she talks about the different ways to engage kids in the garden. And I love what she wrote at the end of her article because I say this all the time as well. She said, I don't mean asking little folks to pull weeds for hours or do your labor. That is a turnoff. And I can't agree more. So Sally recommends all these little projects and bigger projects that you can do with kids, but all designed to really tug at their heart and help them forge a connection to the garden. So I love this article. And then finally in sustainability, the Denver Post shared an article that's called Love to Garden, but Live in a Place with a Tiny Yard. 
This one is very nicely done because it talks about the importance of planning. And the other nice feature of this article is it incorporates advice from a number of different landscape designers in the Denver area. It's very well done. Lots of great tips here. In the continuing ed segment, I found this very in-depth article by Lisa Fazio of the Dark Mountain Project. It's called Radical and Rhizomati Notes from a Folk Herbalist. This is a read that's going to require concentration. This article talks about the history of herbalism as well as herbalism today in our very technical, fast-moving society. In the how-to DIY segment, I shared two posts. The first is this Etsy shop that's called Reform Fibers. And these guys are doing great things in the world of macrame. Of course, macrame is coming back. It's making a comeback. I was just at a nursery yesterday and saw all of these wonderful gorgeous, chunky macrame plant holders. I almost bought one. In fact, I might have to go back and get it because I totally fell in love with it. But what's great about this Etsy shop is they not only offer patterns and finished macrame creations, but they have videos where they actually show you how to do the macrame work. So that I really liked. And then CocoKelly.com, a very fun home and lifestyle website offered a floral tutorial on how to create romantic floral arrangements this spring. Coco Kelly has a lot of wonderful seasonal floral how-to videos, but in this piece, they're focusing on romantic flowers, flowers that usher in spring with subtle colors, using flowers like hellebore, garden roses, and poppies, And this is a top-notch tutorial. And if you've ever wanted to try to do your own spring floral centerpiece, this would be a great starting point to read this particular article and just copy what they tell you to do in this very excellent DIY. It's totally step-by-step. I mean, right down to securing the floral foam. It walks you completely through that. And I just think it's a top-notch floral design blog post for DIYers. So check that out. All right. In the plant spotlight this week is this chili pepper that was in the news that was developed by a gentleman named Mike Smith in North Wales. And he has been growing chilies and vegetables for the past seven years, and he accidentally created what people believe is the hottest chili pepper. In fact, it's so strong, the news reports last week claimed that it could kill you. So the previous record holder for the hottest chili in the world is the Carolina Reaper. And now this new chili pepper is called the Dragon's Breath Chili. In fact, it's so hot that no one has actually eaten it yet. And just so you don't go thinking that this was just a guy playing around in his backyard, he actually worked in collaboration with scientists from Nottingham Trent University who are interested in the medicinal use of chilies for anesthesia uses. Anyway, this university actually is the group that verified that the Dragon's Breath Chili has scored the highest rating ever recorded on the Scoville heat scale of 2.48 million. And I did a little tidbit with my kids about the Scoville scale at the end of my episode featuring Pam's Pepper Jams. So that was back in episode 527 with Pam Hopner of Pam's Pepper Jams. So that was kind of a fun little segment if you want to go check that out. The scientists from this university now believe that if anyone actually tried to eat this chili, your airways would likely close up from the burn and you'd go into anaphylactic shock and die. So now Smith, Mike Smith, is currently waiting for the Guinness Book of World Records to stop by and verify that his chili is the world champion in terms of heat on the Scoville scale. So totally crazy. But that's why the Dragon's Breath Chili was in our plant spotlight this week. 
In the news segment this week is 20 reasons why you should eat an entire avocado every day. This was shared in grabyourhealthy.com, and it primarily focuses on the good fats that are offered by the avocado in terms of health benefits. In the dream guest segment this week are two Japanese floral artists, and they're referred to as AMKK. They're based in Tokyo. They've created what they call a botanical laboratory, and they do floral art. And here's something to check out. I shared a link in the Facebook group to a podcast series that features these two. In fact, it's kind of a documentary, and these two artists are shadowed as they go about their daily routine. They're smoking cigarettes, brewing coffee, and they're engaging in an early morning process that involves quality checking all of the flowers in their space, and they call it waking up the flowers. And their workspace actually has the look and feel of a laboratory. And of course, Japan has been involved in the art of flower arranging since the 6th century. So AMKK is just continuing to extend that tradition into the future. And I love the way this article ends because AMKK is quoted by saying, We travel a lot across the world, but even in conflicted regions, poor countries or rich countries, there's always a florist. It means that for people the world over, they need flowers. Isn't that a great quote as well? Anyway, I loved that. A very inspiring duo with some really amazing work happening over in Japan. In Science This Week, I shared two articles. The first was featured in Apartment Therapy, and it's a brief history of Epsom salt. Of course, there's tons of applications for Epsom salt in the garden. And then also in Science This Week, I shared something from Monica Hemingway's fabulous website, GardeningProductsReview.com. And this is a resource that she's had on her website for a while now, but it's the state-by-state list of soil testing laboratories at cooperative extension offices. So this is a great resource to flag or save in your Facebook saved posts. It's just so great to have all of these state universities and cooperative extension services all listed in one place. In fact, in cases where the universities don't provide soil testing, there's information about alternative options that they recommend. So you'll find a ton of useful information with this particular post. In the shopping segment this week are these adorable embroidered flower sack towels that I stumbled on yesterday when I was visiting a florist shop. The weather was so miserable. I didn't want to be outside in a garden center, but I needed to get a little garden fix. So I went to this absolutely adorable floral shop nearby called the Wild Orchid, and they were selling these handmade flower sack embroidered towels, hand towels for the kitchen that were not only beautiful, but I absolutely loved the little tag that accompanied them. So they were folded neatly, wrapped with a ribbon, and then there was this tiny little clothespin with a business card that said Dory L Designs. And then right on the business card, Dory shares different little recipes And they are just so sweet. There's a different recipe for pretty much every towel that she sells. So she had a little recipe for something she called Sharon's Pink Salad. It had one carton of Cool Whip with cherry pie filling and crushed pineapple and then a can of sweetened condensed milk and then walnuts optional. That that was on the towel that I purchased. And then others featured recipes like Sandy's Veggie Dip or Dill Dip or Raisin Cashew Drops, which I thought looked fantastic, Stuffed Salary, and a cheese ball. So if you're marketing something and you're creating some type of tag for your product, I thought this was a very cute idea. And since she's selling a kitchen product to add in recipes, it was just perfect. And inspiration this week was an article that was shared from Canada. It's about a garden that's called the Secret Path Garden, and it honors an indigenous boy who died running from residential school. This 12-year-old indigenous boy 
who was running away from this Indian residential school in Ontario back in October of 1966. So this garden that was created was dedicated to his story. And the garden features this beautiful moss wall that says, do something. And then nearby were these stacked river stones with water trickling down as if they were tears. And all of that was close to a large pond where there were pine trees, granite rocks, lilies, and a miniature canoe. And it was completely designed to look like the Canadian shield. In fact, white tulips wrapped around the pond. I thought it was very inspiring. In recipes this week, I stumbled on three that are very different. The first was a kohlrabi carpaccio. This is from vermilionroots.com, and it's basically a takeaway from the vegetable butcher, Cara Mangini. And then that led me to another great recipe from Cara Mangini that's featured in her cookbook, The Vegetable Butcher, and it's parsnip ginger layer cake with browned buttercream frosting. So if you're a parsnip grower and you're not sure what to do with all of your leftover parsnips, this would be something really fun to try. And then finally, watermelon.org shared this recipe. It's watermelon pancake sandwiches. So you've got this tiny little hamburger bun-sized pancake and then a flat square of watermelon topped with another pancake medallion. And then they top it with blueberries and syrup. And they look so cute. They would be really cute for the 4th of July or Memorial Day because you've got the red, white, and blue with the pancakes. So they're very visually captivating. You'll have to see the post. And the overview of this recipe says, everyone loves pancakes for breakfast, so why not add some watermelon? This breakfast combines fluffy blueberry pancakes, juicy watermelon, and of course, maple syrup. Put those together and what's not to love about this dish? something kind of fun to try. And then finally in the quote segment, I stumbled on this very old book that was featured in archive.org. So this is a book that was written back in 1883, and it features a poem called Jack in the Pulpit by J.G. Whittier, and it's adorably illustrated. It's a pretty long poem, so I'll abbreviate it a little bit. I'll take some parts from the beginning and the end. But it's very sweet, and if you have Jack in the Pulpit in your garden, it's a lovely woodland plant to have. And of course, the kids love to see it, to spy it. And I've had a few people on Facebook share a picture of a Jack in the Pulpit in their garden because they weren't sure what it is, but it's up right now in the spring. It's popping up, usually before the hostas have fluffed out their leaves. And so you can probably see them now better than you will at some point later in the spring when they're kind of hiding among other shade-loving plants. If you're not familiar with it, it is a wildflower that's native to eastern and midwestern North America, but it's easily grown in shade gardens and it's found all over the United States. And it gets its common name, Jack in the Pulpit, from the shape of the flower. So it's got this little pouch-shaped spathe that's called the pulpit, and then it has this leaf that kind of flaps over and creates a hood. And when you lift that hood, you see this finger-like central spadix that is referred to as Jack. So it's Jack in the pulpit. And it's fun to show kids because they remember it. They, they recognize it when they see it once you tell them the common name Jack in the pulpit. Here's this adorable little poem that I'm using for the quote segment this week, and it's just called Jack in the Pulpit. Jack in the Pulpit preaches today, under the green trees just over the way, squirrel and song sparrow high on their perch, hear the sweet lily bells ringing to church. Come, hear what his reverence rises to say in his low painted pulpit this calm Sabbath day. Meek-faced anemones, drooping and sad, great yellow violets, smiling out glad, buttercups faces, beaming and bright, clovers with bonnets, some red and some white, daisies, their white fingers half-clasped in prayer, dandelions, proud of the gold in their hair, innocence, children, guileless and frail, 
meek little faces upturned and pale, wild wood geraniums all in their best, languidly beaming in purple gauze dressed. All are assembled this sweet Sabbath day to hear what the priest in his pulpit will say. So much for the preacher. The sermon comes next. Shall we tell how he preached it and what was his text? Alas, like too many grown-up folks who play at worship in churches man-builded today, we heard not the preacher expound or discuss, but we looked at the people and they looked at us. We saw all their dresses, their colors and shapes, the trim of their bonnets, the cut of their capes. We heard the wind organ, the bee and the bird, but of Jack in the pulpit, we heard not a word. And that's sweet. Well, if you like Jack in the pulpit, that might be a poem to print out and put on your refrigerator. I remember the first time I got Jack in the pulpit. It was from a private plant sale. It was probably a garden club plant sale that I had gone to. And I got it home and planted it in my front porch garden, which is a north-facing garden. And in the area that gets the least amount of sun, I have a lot of woodland plants. So that's where I put the Jack in the pulpit. And then in the fall, I was cleaning out the bed and getting it ready for winter. And there was this bright red cluster of what looked like berries to me. And at first I thought it was a wayward Christmas decoration, something that had fallen into the garden after Christmas. And then upon closer inspection, I realized it was a seed pod. And it was so striking. I mean, it is the most vivid red possible. It doesn't start out that way. If you know that the jack in the pulpit, the female plant is going to produce this seed pod, you can kind of watch for it in late summer because both the little jack and that hood, that flap of a leaf that goes over Jack's head, they both dry up. And then this big cluster of green berries appears in their place. And then those berries ripen into this amazing cherry Christmas red in early fall. And apparently each berry contains at least one and maybe more seeds. So that's how this plant will propagate. In any case, there's a lot of nice surprises with this plant if you grow it. It's a true delight in the garden. And don't forget, if you can't find Jack in the pulpit in your nursery or your garden center, go ahead and check for it on Craigslist or online at different plant sales in your area because they do spread. And oftentimes you'll find gardeners who are willing to sell some. So don't give up the search. Well, that's it for the Garden News Roundup for this week's show. Just a reminder, you can get all of these posts and more in your Facebook feed if you join the listener community in the free Facebook group for the show. It's called the Still Growing Podcast Group. The next time you're out at Facebook, just type that in, Still Growing Podcast Group, and then click to join. Make sure you're clicking on the group and not the page because there is a business page for the Still Growing Podcast, and you're looking for the podcast group, the Still Growing Podcast Group group. I'd love to meet you in the group. All right. In today's show, I'm sharing the top 40 most wanted list, or as I like to call them, the plants we pine for. This is the most wished for plants, the plants that gardeners around the country mention. If you ask them to finish the sentence, I wish I planted more and then fill in the blank. So I'm going to take you through this list, but I just want to remind you that just because a plant is loved does not mean that it's problem free. So you need to be cautious here. You're going to have to probably in some cases still fight pests or disease or even potentially thuggish spreading behavior in the right circumstances with some of these plants. So if you hear something and you're captivated by it and you want to give it a try in your own garden, do your homework, ask other gardeners, ask about it in the garden center, do some online research about what it's like to grow this plant in your area, be proactive. And this, of course, is not an official list by any means, but it's something that I have curated Over the past couple of weeks, talking with other garden friends, searching for most wanted plants online on social media, and I think it's a pretty comprehensive list. For the most part, I would say these are truly the gorgeous blooms and delicious edibles we can't get enough of. 
We can learn a lot from each other's most wanted lists, so why not? Anyway, I'm going to take you through them. I'll add some anecdotal comments. So I will share these plants with you, but I won't be doing in-depth descriptions of each of these. So you can add that to your homework list as well. However, I will put together a PDF that will have a list of the top 40 most wanted, the plants we pine for. And that way you can print it out and take it with you when you go plant shopping, wherever you like to do that. And that PDF will be in the show notes for today's episode. And I'll also put a link to that in the Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast group, our listener community on Facebook. Okay, so let's dive into our list. First up is alliums. Alliums are one of the absolute best and easiest bulbs to grow. And I don't know why, but people often overlook them. And yet, most people, when they visit a garden, if they see allium, they're immediately taken with it. They're totally gorgeous. They are show-stopping blooms. They're like these huge purple pom-poms on top of a very tall green stem. They are so easy to grow, and their amazing architectural shape mean that they add something truly special to any garden. In fact, I would tell you your shopping list for Allium should include a minimum of seven, because I think when they're planted in mass like that, They're absolutely stunning. So don't stop at just one. This is something that you want to buy an odd number of. The more you can afford, the better and go for it. They come back year over year. The flowers can be super tiny or they can be six inch giants. Anyway, I just love them. I think they are truly the stars of the early part of summer and late spring. The bees love them. Other animals don't. They're completely deer resistant. Dr. Seuss would love them. They look a little otherworldly. They thrive in heat. They're drought tolerant. They're resistant to deer and rabbits. And butterflies love them as well. So allium are definitely something most gardeners wish they had more of in their garden. After they do their first foray into the garden planting allium, they almost always want to plant more. I think the challenge with alliums is the fact that they are a fall bulb that we have to order and then plant in the fall. And of course, sometimes by the time fall rolls around, we can have terrible weather or you can just be suffering from a little bit of garden fatigue and have lost all desire to get out and plant one more thing, which by this time of year, you're probably regretting because I bet planting more allium has been on your list for a while. So challenge yourself for 2017, save some energy and money in your budget at the end of the year to get more allium and plant it for your 2018 garden. Next on the list is Amazonia. By the way, we're going A to Z here, so they're not in any particular order other than alphabetical. And Amazonia is a native plant with many wonderful growing qualities. In fact, Amazonia was the perennial plant of the year for 2011, but the blooms look like little starbursts to me, and they are one of my favorites. The foliage looks great all season as well. I usually cut it back after it blooms, and unfortunately, I think I only have one plant on my property, which is a shame. I need to do something about that. But it's a gorgeous wildflower, and as I was looking online for what people were saying about it, It is apparently very easy to grow from seed and very easy to grow in the garden. I think the variety Blue Ice is especially vibrant. It's a deep, deep blue. And it's one of those plants where if you're questioning, do I have room for Amazonia? Yes, you do. You always have room for more Amazonias. Other plants are just taking up space. So if you have something that's not life-giving to you, replace it with an Amazonia. You'll be glad you did. And I had somebody send me a note a while back asking how much water they need because they were a little worried about it. And I have to say that in general, I don't over baby any of my perennials when they come into my garden. So my Amazonia has been pretty darn tough. It's in my southern garden, so it does get sun and it has wonderful drainage. 
but I never offer it supplemental water other than my regular watering system. And in general, I would tell you they follow the sleep, creep, leap. Now, the knock on these, and for many of these that are on this list, is people will say, well, they only bloom for such a short period of time. But honestly, you guys, if you can have this gorgeous Amazonia bloom, I think most gardeners will agree it's a trade-off they're willing to make. And it's truly something where if you have a visitor to your garden, they may have never seen the bloom before. And just like with the allium, they can't take their eyes off it. And of course, anytime you have a blue flower, those are so highly coveted by people. Well, next on the list is anemone. And if you're fond at all of poppies, you should try anemones. They're a very simple, sweet flower. And I'll never forget the first time I saw one in a garden tour. It was at Carmen Overson's house. She does this wonderful, huge plant sale every single year. And she'll split her anemones. There's probably, I don't know, five to six baby plants that she'll sell every year. And there's just a complete cat fight over who gets these plants. And they're gone in a heartbeat because her anemones look so amazing, so deliriously happy in her garden. And again, the bloom time is very short, but they are absolutely spectacular. They're pretty low maintenance. And there is an estimated 150 species of anemone. So there are a ton to choose from. But in spring, I think they are truly something special to feature in your garden. Next up is basil. I don't think I need to comment too much about how wonderful basil is. But I was laughing when I interviewed Trevor Johnson of the West Bloomfield Henry Ford Hospital Greenhouse because of how much basil he grows in that greenhouse. And I just would love to go over there and just be among all of the basil plants that he grows hydroponically in his greenhouse. And if I had my way, that's probably what I would be doing, growing hundreds of pounds of basil every year. The first year that I grew basil, I think I had two or three plants And once I discovered all the recipes that I enjoy making with basil, everything from pesto to caprese salad to all of the pastas and salads and different noodle dishes that the kids love, I just couldn't get enough of it. So my kitchen garden is now largely devoted to basil. And I'm so tickled that my kids can make a pesto, a basil pesto by heart, all by themselves. They know how to use the little Cuisinart mix and chop, and they can mix up a basil pesto all on their own. And they know how to make a simple basil spaghetti in the summertime that we like to eat cold or hot. And it's just superb. And if you Google the words, I wish I planted more basil, you will be astounded at the results. This is a common sentiment of gardeners everywhere. Well, next on the list is beans, specifically relatively early maturing, like blue bush beans. And beans are such a great plant to get kids involved with in terms of harvesting. It's a great experience for them. And along with the basil, it's often an edible that people start out maybe with one plant and then decide that they want to make space for more in future gardens. Next up are beets. And I love beets. And if you don't like beets, this will probably not be on your most wanted list. But if you like beets, you should try growing beets. In fact, did you know you can grow them in containers? And of course, the nice thing about beets is they're cool season vegetables. And you can not only eat the roots, the beet itself, but you can eat their leafy greens. Now, I love all parts of the beets. I love the variegated foliage. I love the red stems. They're so colorful. I think they look great in containers. And you can plant them in the spring and the fall. And over at Grow, Eat, Glow, they shared a hot pink smoothie. So kind of an alternative. If you're a green smoothie person, this would be a hot pink smoothie. So cute for summer. And the recipe is eight ounces of coconut water, one beet peeled and quartered, six strawberries, a carrot, dates, and a handful of raspberries, and then a little bit of vanilla extract. And that is your hot pink smoothie complete with beets. Doesn't that sound fantastic? Next up is bleeding hearts. 
I talk to so many gardeners this time of year that say they always wish they planted more bleeding hearts whenever they start to bloom. I have them under my deck, which I can see from my basement, my lookout basement. They are up and happily blooming before anything else. So they kind of stand out there all by themselves, but I have white bleeding hearts under my deck. The underside of my deck is painted white. I have a white picket fence back there. So it all blends in beautifully together. Now, here's something that made the list in warmer gardens, and that's camellias. They are so lovely. It's not hard to find posts on social media of people saying they wish they had planted more camellias. And by the way, they love used coffee grounds, just like hydrangeas and roses. So keep that in mind as you're heading out to your coffee shop and they're giving out the coffee grounds this summer. You can put them on your camellias. And then next on the list is clematis or clematis. Now, I always look for them when they are deeply discounted in the fall, and I like to use them a little non-traditionally, meaning that I don't always add them to go vertically in the garden. I plant them as kind of a winding ground cover just to confuse people. So the, when they're visiting my garden and they see a clematis on the ground and they're not expecting it, they often say, what is that? And then I love to laugh and say, oh, that's a clematis. Just drives people crazy. But they're fun that way. They're a great little filler in the garden. So don't despair if you have no trellis or no fence or anything vertical for them to climb on. You don't need to use them that way. You can definitely do what I do and add some as a gorgeous ground cover, as a trailing vine on the ground. And before we wrap things up with the letter C, I just want to mention that there are a fair amount of gardeners this time of year who experimented with cover crops over the winter. They do so much to fix nitrogen, restore the soil, add nutrients back And if you'd like to learn more, I interviewed Sarah Griffin Bubakar of Peaceful Valley Grow Organic back in episode 514, and you can learn more about cover crops in that episode. Well, a classic spring blooming bulb that people often wish they had planted more of this time of year are daffodils. I love the classic daffodils. I love the whites, the white varieties. There are dwarf varieties. They are naturalizing. They are deer resistant. There are so many things to love about daffodils. And when I interviewed both Joanne Vandenberg Ohms and Tim Shipper, both descendants of bulb growing families, they had to concur that daffodils are truly probably the very best pick to make when you're planting spring flowering bulbs, just given their deer resistance, their easiness to grow, and their naturalizing abilities. Another great ornamental, starting with D, is dahlias. People love dahlias. They grow them from tubers. You start with a single good eye, and then by the end of the season, you should have multiple. If you want to plant dahlias, you want to wait until the ground is warmer, when there's less rain and no frost, because you don't want the tubers to rot. So I usually plant mine late in June. And whenever I think about dahlias, I always think about my dear friend, Doris. Her daughter was having a garage sale, and Doris was selling some plants, including dahlia tubers. And so, of course, I'm buying up all of this plant material. And right before I left, I said, what are these dahlias? What's, what are the names of these dahlias? And she said, I have no idea, but they were going to be a beautiful red And so I said, you know what? I'm going to call them my Doris Dahlias in your honor. And over the years, Doris has come to my garden and she just laughs every time I say, oh, here are my Doris Dahlias. And the bloom is so striking. They make great cut flowers. And I don't think you can ever, ever, ever overplant Dahlias. I don't think you'll regret that. However, what you might regret is not digging up the tubers at the end of the season, in the fall, before the ground gets cold. Because, of course, again, they're not going to overwinter underground in freezing temperatures. So just like when it's difficult to get out to plant spring flowering bulbs because the fall weather is kind of getting crummy and cold and 
you might be fighting garden fatigue, the same can be said for having to go back out and dig up your dahlia tubers. And I confess, even I one year let my Doris dahlias go. I was just too darn tired to get out there and dig them up. And so I bid adieu to my dahlias, and I tell you, I had the biggest case of remorse the following year, not only because they were gorgeous, but because of the sentimental factor as well. So I had to confess to Doris what I had done, and she generously replenished my dahlia supply, my Doris dahlia supply, which I have never abused like that ever again. All right, the next two are listener suggestions. The first is Evergreen's. Evergreens, of course, add great structure to the garden, and they fill up the space year-round. So even in the spring when things look a little bare, it's nice to have evergreens in the garden. This next one is a favorite of Danny Perkins, a longtime listener of the show and a great contributor in the Still Growing Podcast group, and that is Foxglove. I know Robert Corrick loves Foxgloves. Robert's the author of the book Understanding Roots from episode 529. And foxgloves are great if you want something taller blooming in the spring in the garden. They can be exceptionally tall, depending on the variety. And they are biannuals. They're biannual flowers. So the first year they are green, and then the second year they flower, and then they die. So I always plant a few foxglove each year, so I always have blooms. Otherwise, if you start out with foxglove and you don't keep replenishing, they will eventually all die out. Now, they do throw seeds, thousands of seeds, so they may self-seed themselves in your garden, depending on how happy they are. New plants usually start in the fall, and then they'll mature over the next year, and then they bloom, especially in warmer climates. And don't forget that foxglove is very poisonous. In fact, digitalis is derived from foxglove. So keep that in mind if you plan to use foxglove in your garden. All right, another common thing that people often wish that they had planted more of are fruiting trees and shrubs. Now, there were just so many different recommendations here. I didn't include all of them, but there is one I'd like to draw your attention to, and that's the honeyberry. So my friend Marianne Newcomer was on a podcast recently, and she was talking about how she has gone away from planting blueberries and started planting honeyberries. She feels that she gets more production, and overall, she's very thrilled with the plant. Now, these berries are interesting because they're kind of elongated, so they're almost like a blue grape but they have a high level of antioxidants and they're kind of a sweet blueberry-like flavor that's good for making preserves or just fresh eating. And get this, these plants are super long lasting. They can last for up to 50 years. And here's the other great thing about them. They are exceptionally cold hardy. Some even grow well in zone two. They can handle temperatures as low as negative 50 degrees. And if you decide you want to go with the honeyberry plant, make sure you plant two because they need to pollinate one another. So fruiting trees and shrubs, I don't think you can ever go wrong. But this year, do what my friend Marianne Newcomer is recommending and try the honeyberry. I think I'm going to give it a go as well. If they can live in negative 50 degree Fahrenheit, they should do just fine here in Minnesota. All right. This next one is something that I talked to Bree Arthur about a few episodes back, and that is garlic. And of course, we discussed how easy garlic is to grow. And Bree's recommendation is that you make use of all of your perimeter edging in your garden and plant garlic all along the perimeter of your beds. I forget just how many garlic plants Brie harvests, but I know when I was talking to Megan Kane, the creative vegetable gardener, about growing garlic, she said the exact same thing. Once you get started, especially if you are a cook, you can never have enough garlic. And of course, anyone appreciates receiving a garlic braid from a friend. Now, in the number 17 spot is hellebores. Now, last year, my friend Julie Thompson Adolf shared a blog post on her Garden Delights website about how to grow hellebores from seed. And hellebores, or Linton roses, are remarkably cold tolerant. The flower is so delicate looking. 
And a few weeks ago, I stumbled on a really nice video from Shady Grove Gardens that did a great job sharing about how to grow, hydrate, and hold cut hellebores. And they featured this designer named Susan that's been working with hellebores for 31 years, and she shared her best hellebore tips in this video. So if you're interested in that, look for that in the Facebook group. This next one is a favorite of mine, and I know the first time I saw it in a garden, it was a cottage garden with a ground cover primarily of Mother of Time and then this fabulous plant, Love in a Mist. Love in a Mist has these gorgeous blue flowers, white flowers, and the seed pods are a favorite of mine to work with in bouquets. Love in a Mist, the language of Love in a Mist is perplexity. And it makes complete sense because it is such an interesting and curious looking flower. It's also known as devil in the bush and it's from the buttercup family. It also goes by the common name maypop and that phrase devil in a bush that sometimes people refer to them as has to do with what happens to these guys when they dry because after the blooms have disappeared, the seed pods are kind of spiky and they dry up among all of this spidery foliage, which looks like this bush enveloping a little devil. So that's how it got that name. But I always refer to them as love in a mist. And sometimes at garage sales, you can get little Ziploc bags of the seed pods so that you can start it in your garden. And that's what we do here in Minnesota. We'll start sprinkling the seed pods around the garden in springtime so that we have blooms all summer long. All right, number 19 on the list is a mesclun salad mix. I have many garden friends that start these in milk jugs. They just do a very heavy sprinkle of the seeds and then grab them in chunks when you transplant them. You know, if you want the mix to get big, then sow fewer seeds. If you like the little tiny baby greens, then you can sow them pretty heavy. I like to do a little mix of both. And then don't forget that there was this article that had come out last year that I shared in the Garden News Roundup about the very best way to keep these salad greens from rotting after you've harvested them. And it was an article that was shared by thekitchen.com. And basically, you store the leaves after you've patted them dry in between pieces of paper towel. Anyway, new gardeners are usually very thrilled with their little salad mixes once they get going with them. They generally do so well, and they're very fun. You can just keep repeat sowing them through the spring into the early summer. All right, we're at the halfway point here, and in the number 20 spot is milkweed. Now, there was a great article that was written by American Meadows last spring, and it was all about how to germinate and grow milkweed seed. And then monarchbutterflygarden.net last spring shared container gardening ideas for milkweed varieties. So if you're interested in growing milkweed, both of those articles would be great starting points. Of course, milkweed numbers are down and reduced milkweed has contributed to fewer monarchs. So there are a number of organizations around the country that are encouraging all of us to grow milkweed with the primary goal of increasing both the number and species of milkweed available. All right, in the number 21 spot is just a very general comment about something that people wish they planted more of in their garden, and that is trees. And of course, there's that quote, the best time to plant a tree was, what, 30 years ago? And then the next best time is today. But this was a common lament that people had on social media. It was the word they most often ended the sentence, I wish I planted more of, and it was just the general term trees. So if you recently purchased a property or you're new to a property, make that be one of your first steps. Work with an arborist, work with someone at a garden center, and plant a diverse variety of trees on your property. You never know how long you're going to be there, and the dividends of planting your trees early pay off in spades over time. So divert maybe some of your gardening budget toward planting trees on your property. Over time, you'll be glad you did. Next up is Napa cabbage. 
I remember one of the first times my garden friend grew Napa cabbage. She sent me a picture and she said, I just don't even have the heart to pick it. She thought it was so beautiful. But, you know, Napa cabbage is something you can grill. It looks fantastic. I was just at the grocery store that the kids work at and the lady behind the cheese counter and I always chit chat and she's like, get some Napa cabbage or romaine cabbage and grill it with a little vinegar and olive oil. And then add some Roma tomatoes that you've cut in half that you also grill. And then sprinkle that with parm. Just load the parm, the Parmesan Reggiano on top. She's like, you just wouldn't believe how fantastic that is. All right, next up is Sicilian honey lily. These are close relatives of alliums. They have bell-shaped flowers. We're not going to grow them up here in Minnesota. They're not freeze-hardy. They are frost-hardy. And they can be easily grown in sunny or partially shaded sites. They're also known as Mediterranean bells. And I think they're hardy through zone five. So if I wanted to give them a go, I'd have to try to plant them in a microclimate in my southern rock garden. But bees love this flower. They are truly gorgeous. You can see when you're looking at the stem how they're related to alliums. They've got that allium stem, long and smooth. And they're beautiful. They kind of stand up above the other flowers. And they're eye-catching, which is why people would like to plant more of them. You know, while I was looking into this plant, I found this great post on Facebook that was talking about how to create a tropical-looking garden in USDA zones 5, 6, 7, 8, and maybe 9, so in the middle part of the country. And they put together this great list of trees, shrubs, and perennials that are lushly foliaged and tropical or exotic looking. Anyway, it's a great comprehensive list, and I will be sharing it in the Facebook group this week. In the 24 spot, along with garlic, of course, would be onions. And again, onions are something that Brie would suggest that you plant on the perimeter of your garden, on that edging, that border of your garden to make use of your edge space. And if you are a cook, of course, onions and garlic are the foundation to most meals. So it makes sense to produce and grow tons of onions on your property. Number 25 is peas. Peas, snow peas, black-eyed peas, sugar snap peas. People can never get enough of peas. You can eat them straight from the vine. They're fantastic in salads. They're wonderful. And then in the number 26 spot is potatoes. And a lot of times people can justify the space for potatoes because they eat them so frequently, just like with onions and garlic. You know, Joel Karsten, the author of the great book, Straw Bale Gardens, recommends growing your potatoes in a straw bale. And when they're done growing, when the vine has died on the top, you just kick the bale over and the potatoes fall out. He said it's the absolute easiest way to grow potatoes. So if you're interested in that, take a listen to those episodes. They're back in... Episode 515, 516, 517, he talks all about growing potatoes in straw bales. Next up is primroses. These are also flowers that bloom in the early spring. They're very fragrant. Of course, they're not cold hardy here in Minnesota, but they are cold hardy in the mid-Atlantic United States. They're also sold as houseplants. So sometimes you might see them that way. Make sure if you get them as a house plant too that you pinch out any spent blooms. They're such a happy flower and they can sometimes seed themselves too along the edges of your borders. So that's a great bonus. You know, they really brighten the garden and they just look always happy even when it's raining outside. All right, number 28 is not a particular plant or flower. It's a color and it's the color purple because of course bees have a preference for purple, and purple looks so fantastic in the garden. And many people often assume that the favorite color for bees would be red, but research dating all the way back to the early 2000s showed that scientists were able to prove that bees preferred purple, also yellows and blues, but not red. So consider that when you're planting your garden this year. In the 29 spot is radish. I always think of my dad when I plant radishes because he grew up eating radish sandwiches and my grandmother always had tons of radish. 
And around here, John, my little John, is the one that helps me plant radish in the spring. Number 30 is rhubarb. Now, people either love it or hate it. So, for instance, when I spoke with Bree a few weeks ago, Bree's like, I don't need any more rhubarb. On the other hand, I love rhubarb. And, you know, rhubarb is tough. You can count on it to come back year after year in your cold climate, and it can live for more than 25 years in the garden. And don't forget when you're cooking with rhubarb, rhubarb is 95% water, so it cooks down very fast. And of course, to counteract the tartness of rhubarb, you're going to be adding probably lots of sugar to any rhubarb dessert or pastry item that you might be making. Now, my favorite rhubarb dessert is one that my mom makes, so I thought it would be fun to give her a call and have her tell us about this fantastic little dessert she used to make when I was a little girl. It's still my favorite. Hello. Hey there. Is mom there? How's your day going? Oh, it's going okay. I was going to call and see if mom had her rhubarb recipe handy. Oh, yes. I probably have it in my memory. Where did you get rhubarb? I have rhubarb growing in my garden, so I thought I'd make some. Oh, well, that's nice. Okay. You want the one with the raspberry or what what, what recipe? I was thinking about the one with the Jiffy white cake mix. Oh, sure. That's what that's simple. So I'll go get that, but I can memorize that. I think it's just some rhubarb and sugar and raspberries and then the, do they still make Jiffy cake mix? Yep. I'll be darned. Use white. I think you use white. I remember you using the white box. And then butter. Okay. Rhubarb raspberry dessert. How's that for getting my fingers on something real quick? That's pretty good. Okay. Put four or five cups finely chopped rhubarb into the bottom of a 9 by 15 glass cake pan. Okay. Now, what it, what it doesn't say is I always took like a frozen stick of butter. Okay. And I just take the wrapper back a little bit so I can keep my hands clean. I don't take the whole wrapper off, but just make it so you can use the end. And I would go back and forth on the bottom of that cake pan and around the edges because you don't want it to stick for cleaning up, see? Okay. And this, and this never told you that. So just... Make sure you put butter around the edges in the bottom of your pan, and then it's four to five, and you're just dumping this stuff into the pan so you don't even need a mixing bowl, which is really nice. Okay. And if you're 9 by 15, usually pans are 12 by 15, so, you know, just use your 12 by 15, and it's not, if you put in six cups of rhubarb, oh, well. Oh, well. Yeah, so four to five cups, chop, really fine chop. Well, not really fine, but nice fine because you don't want a big clump in your mouth. Okay. And you sprinkle one cup of sugar over that rhubarb. All right. And you sprinkle one cup of miniature marshmallows. Now, if you don't have miniature and have big ones, you can take your, if you have a kitchen shears, and cut up big marshmallows into four chunks, you know. Okay. Half of them and half of them again. So you sprinkle over a cup of sugar and a cup of miniature marshmallows. And then you add at least a cup of red raspberries. So you can just buy a couple packages of fresh raspberries in the grocery store or you can buy frozen. But if they're fresh, then, you know, you don't have to wait for them to thaw. Okay. This is where you and Laura got your hands all cut up because I was thawing out my frozen rhubarb. Uh, or my frozen raspberries, and Marge and I were out sitting on the picnic table, and you came out, and your hands were all cut up because those rhubarb or those raspberry cans at the time, you know, when you peeled off the top, then there was a sharp ridge all around the inside, kind of a metally ridge. Do you remember that? No. God, Marge says, what have you been doing? And I'm like, oh, my God, got into my raspberries. Okay, so I would put in two, throw two packages of fresh raspberries over the top, and now you pour over all of that your white, your box of white Jiffy cake mix. Okay. And if they don't have that, it's just a half a box of another kind of cake mix, don't matter what kind you buy. Sure. And, hey, there is no butter other than for, for greasing your pan, and you bake at 350. 
for about 40 to 50 minutes. You just watch, and when it's all bubbly and the cake mix itself has browned, you know, so it looks like yummy. Okay. You're done. All right. It says raspberries are optional, of course, but it tastes like a berry shortcake if you use them, you know. Yep. And then you can serve that with whipped cream on top or ice cream, and it is also good plain. And then you refrigerate it after it's cooled and everybody's had some. If there's any left, you refrigerate the rest. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so it's pretty darn easy. You just got to have the ingredients. Yeah, I remembered it, but I couldn't I couldn't find our exact recipe online. So I thought, oh, I'm just going to call you and and have you tell me. Oh yeah, that's nice. But it's rained all day. <laughs> I know it's rained. It was pouring here when I dropped Emma off at work. <laughs> yeah, but it's been a good day. We've just started organizing this morning and it's just I'm I'm just getting red on the minutia. So Well, and- the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, mom. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> who who else was doing this? Me. I've been organizing all day, too. Oh, well, good. Yeah. Good. Very good. And throwing and pitching. Well, not so much that, but more organizing. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm throwing all this extra stuff. Yeah, I'm the saver. You're the thrower. Yeah, Dad's the saver, too. All righty. Well, let you go. All right. Love you. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, so there you go, straight from the horse's mouth, my mom's Jiffy Cake Mix rhubarb dessert. I've never found anything to beat it. It's my sentimental favorite. Okay, next on the list is Indian rhubarb, also known as umbrella plant. And if you've ever looked at the album cover for the show, the little pink flower that's on the album cover is umbrella plant, also known as Demera peltata. Now, I love this plant because it does so many wonderful things. First, in the spring, it sends up this beautiful pink blossom. And then when the flower dies back, it sends up leaves. And the leaves are huge. They're more round than a regular rhubarb plant. And they stand up tall. It's a native woodland. And you would not believe the fall color. They're absolutely glorious. They're every shade of orange and red and yellow in the fall, and they're glorious. So to me, this plant is striking throughout the entire year. Now, it's a great plant if you've got a moist or kind of a wet area. And when I say these leaves are are kind of big, like rhubarb leaves, they're very big. They can be up to a foot across. And like rhubarb, it's a perennial. It's going to come back every single year. But it's definitely a plant that I'm just so tickled with in my garden. I would never part with it. And it's a great structural plant to incorporate into your garden. All right, number 32 on the list is snapdragons. Snapdragons are fun. Kids can squeeze the flower on the sides to make it look like the snapdragons are talking. They're one of my all-time favorites. And I stumbled on this image of dried snapdragon seed pods. And once you see the seed pods all dried up, you'll see the face of the dragon. So I'll share this picture in the Facebook group. If you've never seen those dried seed pods or wondered why they were called snapdragons, it becomes super clear and obvious when you see the seed pods. All right, number 33 and a recently trending item is spaghetti squash. Now, if you love spaghetti squash or butternut or winter squash for that matter, you probably wish you planted more if you try to make it through the winter with a nice supply of squash. This is something I talked to Megan Kane about, the creative vegetable gardener, back in episode 557. And my friend Christy Lynn Olson gave me a fantastic recipe for a Tex-Mex baked spaghetti squash. So I'll be sharing that in the group this week as well. But just make sure if you're growing spaghetti squash that they need to be ripe when you pick them. They can weigh four to six pounds. They should be golden yellow in color as well. So don't be impatient. Don't harvest them too early. In fact, a great way to tell if it's ready is that the skin of the squash won't be able to be pierced with a fingernail when it's ready. And if the skin is soft, it's not ready. And spaghetti squash is great on the grill as well. Okay, in the number 34 spot for plants we pine for, it's sugar baby watermelon. 
Now, this is the icebox type, and it's a widely adapted heirloom variety that is sweet, and it contains high levels of antioxidants. You still need full sun, well-drained soil, and you need about 78 days for this to mature. So for all of you gardeners out there with limited space, you can grow watermelons. And again, this was a variety when I searched on social media. It was an edible that people wished they had grown more of. Now, when Danny Perkins replied to this question, in addition to mentioning foxglove, he also mentioned sunflowers. And sunflowers are also one of my favorite flowers. I grow them every year, many varieties. I grew this huge variety a few years back that was over 10 feet tall. You can get mammoth or dwarf. Try a bunch of them, all different colors from the burgundies and the blacks to the golds. They are absolutely fantastic for attracting birds. The finches just love them. In fact, when they're done, I let them dry and then I cut them, hanging them upside down in a dry place. They're great winter food for birds and small animals. And there's just absolutely nothing more eye-catching or vibrant than sunflowers in full bloom. Don't forget the petals are edible as well, so they can be fun to add to a salad. And it's easy to fall in love with sunflowers. They are glorious. All right, next up is tomatoes. And from our listener community, Trisha Ackerman said this exact thing. She loves homegrown tomatoes. And I would say on behalf of my family that every year we wish we would have planted more cherry tomatoes. In fact, I grow my cherry tomatoes in hanging baskets right under the deck on the edge. And it faces south so they get full sun. But right beneath them are my raised beds where I grow my lettuce fixings. And so it's super easy for the kids to come through, harvest the lettuce, and then just grab some cherry tomatoes and incorporate them into this huge stainless steel bowl when they're harvesting edibles for our salads. In the 37 spot is tulips. I had a lot of listeners write in how much they wish they had planted more tulips in the fall. And of course, tulips can be blooming all the way through June, depending on the variety that you pick. So again, if you want more tulips, you have to be very disciplined and committed when fall rolls around that you're going to get out there and plant tulips. Number 38 is a plant that's not hardy here in Minnesota, but it's commonly mentioned when people say, I wish I would have planted more of this, and it's the shrimp plant. And I saw a beautiful photo of a white shrimp plant. And when these lavender orchid-like blooms fade, the bracts, like other shrimps, remain for a long time. These are part shade to full sun plants, and they're absolutely gorgeous. They can spread fairly rapidly, though. So you need to be sensitive to that, depending on where you're going to plant it. Of course, my dear friend, Jen McGinnis of Frau Zinni, chimed in, and she said, of course, zinnias. And she's not alone. There are so many people that are zinnia crazy. The site Grow Veg showed this beautiful combination of zinnia, cosmos, and cleome together. In March, the National Garden Bureau shared a photo of zinnia queen lime with blotch. It's a green color zinnia with a rose center. It's a showstopper. And of course, zinnias are perfect companions in the vegetable garden. And interestingly enough, they're a genus of plants of the sunflower tribe within the daisy family. And did you know that it was the very first flower to grow in space by NASA? In any case, for many people, zinnias are a sentimental favorite. They're a flower that your parents and your grandparents may have planted, and so you've cultivated this love for zinnias from a very young age. Butterflies love zinnia. In fact, Europe's most famous migratory butterfly, the Painted Lady, can be lured into gardens with zinnias. And if you're looking at incorporating zinnias this year, Don't forget that you can choose between compact, powdery, mildew-resistant zinnias and mid-size varieties like Cut and Come Again or tall varieties like State Fair. And a study from the University of Kentucky found that the heirloom lily putt attracted twice as many butterflies as Oklahoma and State Fair. And finally, 
in the last spot, number 40 is zucchini. This year, I'm going to grow three different zucchini varieties. And Patio Star from Territorial Seeds is very compact. And the yellow ones are the yellow straight neck or the yellow crooked neck. And the seed package will tell you the time to maturity. Now, although many people say they wish they would have planted more zucchini, you need to keep in mind that each plant is very productive. In fact, they're some of the most productive food producing plants ever. So I have a lot of love for zucchini and cooking with zucchini. And despite how prolific these plants can be, oftentimes gardeners are looking to plant even more. (laughs) And I love it when someone gets on social media and says that they accidentally planted too many zucchini bushes. (laughs) Accidentally. But you know what? It's all good. I have never turned down zucchini if someone's offered it to me. And you can do all kinds of great things in the kitchen with zucchini, including a great zucchini Tuscan skillet that's from Six Sisters, and zucchini enchiladas that are featured by Delish. And I'll put both of those in the Facebook group this week. Well, that's it from Allium to Zucchini, the 40 most wanted list, or as I say, the plants we pine for, the most wished for plants, the gorgeous blooms and delicious edibles that we can't get enough of. I hope this list has inspired you to go all out on the plants that you have a passion for, the plants that are so life-giving to you. Don't forget to do that. Make sure you budget time and energy around incorporating more of those things into your garden. Well, that's it for today's show. Just a reminder, I will have a PDF of the list of the top 40 most wanted list over at my website at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. And just click on podcast on the main menu and today's episode will pop right up. I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions. I have a new editor, Paul Schuler. Welcome, Paul. I'm Kadena, my copywriter, and David Gregerson, my project manager. I could not do the show without their help. I also want to thank the listeners from the Facebook group that make up my listener advisory board, Beth Engel, Denise Pugh, Denise Gardens in Northern Mississippi, and is a contributing writer to Mississippi Gardener Magazine, Amy Von Atchen, Patricia Chandler Newport, she's the owner of Backyard Urban Gardens out of Kego Harbor, Michigan, Deb Gibson, and Peggy Ann Montgomery. She's a brand manager at American Beauty's Native Plants and was featured in episode 553. We talked all about native plants. Don't forget to contact me on the number for the show if you have a memorial garden that you'd like to share with me. You can reach me at 865-333-GROW. That's 865-333-4769. Just go ahead, leave your name, number, and tell me about your memorial garden. And then don't forget the next time you're over at Facebook, just search for the Still Growing Community, the private Facebook group that I host for gardeners of all skill levels and locations. Look for the Still Growing Podcast group in the search bar and our group will pop right up. You can just request to join. I would love to meet you in the group. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you have the time or the interest, go ahead and try your hand at my mom's rhubarb dessert and have a great week, everyone. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a sixfootmama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is a weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow.